So now that we've learned how to import experimental data into a Jupyter Notebook, we want to start doing something with the data. We want to start modeling it. So what I've got here is a repeat of our import of some experimental data of a cart going up and down a ramp. Um, it's the same process we've done before. Uh, we create a database by reading in uh, an Excel file that's got uh, all the data we want in it. We can create all sorts of plots that we might be interested in, the position versus time, the velocity versus time, the very messy acceleration versus time. What we want to do next is compare this experimental data with a model, with the way we expect the system to behave. So here, for example, the position looks an awful lot like a parabola, which is what you would expect for constant acceleration motion. But how close is it actually to a parabola? Uh, is there any sort of, of asymmetry that might arise because of air resistance? If it is a parabola, then does the concavity of that parabola match the concavity you would expect based on the acceleration due to gravity? Uh, same thing here. We got velocity versus time. Looks pretty linear, which is, again, what you would expect. But how close is it to a line? And if it is really close to a line, does the slope equal 9.8 meters per second squared, or is it significantly different from that? So in order to do that, we're going to start defining functions in Python. So I have an earlier video specifically about defining functions. Now we're going to talk about specifically making functions uh, that we can use in these physical models. So the way a function works, you use the DEF abbreviation for define. Uh, Jupyter Python knows what DEF stands for. That's why it gives it this nice bright blue color. Then you give it a function name. Now, it doesn't matter what you name the function, as long as it's not a name that's already taken up. So no ABS, no MAX or MIN, right, functions that are already built in. Uh, but something like VModel, I'm pretty sure there's not something in Python called VModel. So we're going to call this VModel for the velocity model. And then you do an open parentheses, close parentheses, and this is where you put the inputs, right? So just like when you're writing a function in a math class, you have F of x, the of means it goes inside parentheses. This is v model of some parameters. And so we're going to have our input parameters go into the parentheses here. So I want to think about what parameters I need to pass in to my v model. Well, if I go to my constant acceleration model up here, I see that I need to provide a vi, I need to provide an a, and I need to provide a T. And so literally, that's what I do. I just take the items that I need for my inputs, and I just list those one by one, separated by commas. The order doesn't really matter. I mean, give it an order that makes sense to you, so that if you want to just be able to put them in quickly, you don't have to reference the order. But I'll show you a trick in a minute about why the order it doesn't really matter. It's a little bit flexible for you. Uh, so then I would put in the equation. This is the part where you do the math. So the way Python knows that we're inside of a function here is you place a colon, and then in an indented block here, you notice I'm indented by two spaces here. With the indentation, it's saying everything that's indented is underneath the function. And as soon as you get to something that's not indented, you have left the function. That's how Python keeps track of whether something is in the function or not, is whether we are indented. And so here I would put in the calculation that I want. In that, this case, it's velocity initial plus acceleration times time. So let's put that in, v initial plus a times t. And you can write this however you want. You can have this take up however many uh, lines you want. So maybe you want to parse this out uh, in a few more steps for your students. Maybe you want to create something called a t that's equal to a times t. And then you want your v to equal vi plus at, right? Maybe you want to do it that way to show them, you know, parcel this out step by step. You could write it this way. You could have this take however many lines you want. There's really no limitation on how long the text inside of a function can be. I think for the sake of illustration, we'll just have it be one line because that, I don't know, that's easier for me to read, but maybe you like it chunked better. You can write it however you want. At the end of the function, you need to use the return command. Return means we're done with the function. I want you to go back to what you were doing before. And then after the return, you specify what outputs you want it to have. Now, you can actually have multiple outputs to a Python function. We're just going to stick with one right now because we want uh, to return the velocity that we've calculated from our model. Uh, I'm going to click Run here. 
And they're de defining the, the V model won't itself do anything on the screen. It's just sort of storing that in memory. So I had it print V model define just to confirm we got to the end of the code cell fine without any issues. So now that I've run this, this Jupyter Notebook now knows a function called V model. And that function persists from one code cell to the next. And anything I do in one code cell affects the next one, affects the next one, et cetera, et cetera, as long as I run them in order. So if you're doing this with your students, make sure they're running their code cells in order. Uh, if you ever need to run an entire sheet, uh, you can go to runtime, click run all, it will just run the entire thing. Or if you want to run everything that came before this cell, you can click run before, or you can click run after to run the things that happen after it. It's pretty cool the way they have those shortcuts set up for you. So anytime you define something new in Python, you always want to test it. You want to make sure that it's doing what you think it will. So I've got a test down here for us to print the value of V model with a VI of zero, an A of zero, and a T of zero. And the what I'm doing here is illustrating that you can actually set this up where the order doesn't matter. If you use argument equals number, argument equals number, argument equals number, you don't have to worry about the order because it will permute those around to be whatever order it needs to be. So you could list this in order V-I-A-N-T, or maybe you want to list it in order of the complexity of the dimensions and you wanted to do T-V-I-A. That's fine. You can do any order you want if you use this variable equals thing. And that's also nice for students because then they're able to remember what each of these means, uh, assuming that they give the variables names that make sense, right? Always give the variables names that you can remember what they are later. You can name a variable Sally, but you might not remember what Sally stood for later, right? So let's try this out. So first let's do some mental math here. So if I have an initial velocity of zero and an acceleration of zero, then at time t equals zero, I ought to have zero velocity still. So let's try that out. Sure enough, I get zero. Let's try it at a later time. Let's try it at a time of 10. Still zero. Okay, pretty simple case so far. Uh, let's try it a little bit differently now. Let's give it an acceleration of one. So if I have an acceleration of one. I should have one times 10 gives me 10, plus a VI of zero still gives me 10. So let's try out this. 10, all right. Uh, let's try something else here. Let's increase the V initial. Let's make that a 0 0.178, right? Always try something weird random so that you don't end up with you know some weird case of like well two plus two equals two times two equals two to the two right always throw in some random seeming number there to test lo and behold we get a 10.178 this v model seems to be doing what we expected so what i'll ask you to do next is add code to this cell to carry out the calculation of the position x using the equation above so go back up here look up what uh, x as a function of time is, what your model x is, and then again think about what information you need to pass as inputs and what information you want to have come out as outputs and what math the code needs to do uh, in the middle there. So once you're able to do that, uh, you want to start generating some data from the function. You want to have something to graph from the model alongside the measurements. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna go back to our database and we're going to record a new column called velocity model, right? So we didn't have a velocity model for, we had position, velocity, acceleration, and time, but we don't have something called velocity model. So anytime I do this, anytime I say database of a key, a, a column label that doesn't exist yet, it's gonna create a new one for us. So you can assume that we are opening up a new column in the database there, which is pretty cool. So we're going to use V model here, and let's try out a V initial of 0 0.4. Uh, I got that number from an estimate of what V initial looks like here. It looks like it's at about 0 0.4. We'll see if it works. And then I'm going to try an acceleration of negative 1. Why negative 1? Well, because uh, it's a negative slope. I might as well try a negative 1. You know, you got the only way you'll find out is if you try it out and give it a go. Uh, and then my t value, right, I need to have a value for t. Well, I actually have several values of t that I want to try, right? Because if I go back up to my graph here, I've actually got a whole slew of values for time I want to try. I really want to do all of them. And this is one of the beauties of Python. Remember, if you pass a list or an array, a, a, a smattering of numbers in as an argument to a function, it's going to treat it like that set of numbers, and it's going to do the operation on all those numbers in one go. So if I come back down here, when I pass database of time as my t value, well then 
it's going to return to me an array of V model values, one for each of those time values. So let's run this. I, I did not have it print anything uh, as a confirmation. Let's have it print uh, database of the velocity model. I should have done copy paste there. There we go. That looks reasonable. I got out numbers, right? All we're doing here is checking to make sure we got numbers. None of them is too enormous, uh, but I need to graph that to get an idea of what it actually looks like. So this is where we can do something really cool because this is where I can take my measurement values, the things I got from my experiment, I can take my model values, the values that I got from the constant acceleration model, and now I can try to put those on the same graph to get an idea of how good my model is. So this is where we're going to use the matplotlib uh, scatter and plot function. So plot here by default creates a line graph. It's going to take my values and connect them. That's the one I want to use for my model because I'm assuming that my model works everywhere. It's nice and smooth. It's nice and mathematical. So that's just a visual reminder to me that that's my model that I'm using. My velocity measurements, on the other hand, I'm going to use a scatter plot for because those were discrete values that I measured in the lab. And I don't really know what it was in between there. I can visually interpolate between those data points. But I would really like to visually distinguish the measurements from the model. So we're going to do that by using scatter and by using plot. So let's click run here. And lo and behold, I get out. Uh, both of these values, right? I get out dots as my measurements and my line as my model, and it's an okay fit. Uh, it looks like I did a pretty decent job picking my initial value, but my slope is off a little bit. I need my slope to be a little bit steeper, so I need to become just, just a little more negative. And so what I can do now, if I'm a student doing this lab, I can go back up to where I created these model parameters. And I can say, OK, I need my acceleration to be a little bit lower. Let's try negative 1.2. And let's leave the v initial at 0 0.4 for right now. I can play with that later if I need to. Lo and behold, I get some different answers here. Now let's rerun this to create our graph. OK, I went too far the other way because now I've got my uh, trend line, my model fit, going a little bit too far below. So let's split the difference. Let's go to a negative 1.1, get my database velocity model, get my graphs now. Okay, that's looking better. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me as I continue to tweak this that this half of the data in the first half going up is slightly below the line, but this half on the way down is slightly above the line. So as a student plays with this, what you might prompt them to think about is, uh, do we know that this thing actually has a consistent slope? In other words, do we know that this thing had constant acceleration? Or is it possible there was one acceleration on the way up and another acceleration on the way down? This is the beginning of exploring the impact of air resistance because on the way up, air resistance and gravity work with each other. But on the way down, air resistance and gravity work against each other. And so this is where you can start to have these conversations about what are the limits of our model, how do we push the boundaries of our model, and if we want to take into account air resistance, what do we need to do? How do we need to change this simple linear function that is the same on one side as it is on the other? What do I need to change about that uh, in order to take into account the effect of air resistance. And so that's some fun ways uh, that you can explore the data there using that model. Um, there's, there's really several different ways you can, you can try to fit data to a model, right? You can do an actual you know, linear regression, chi-square fit, that kind of thing. And that's valuable uh, in terms of that's a skill that students need to learn. But I do think it's valuable for them at first to play around with the model parameters and kind of get that best line fit themselves so that when they do a linear regression later, when they later offload that to the computer, they have an idea of what the computer is doing and how to tell if it actually succeeded. So the other thing we'll ask you to do on this is repeat this exercise for the uh, position. So we want you to create database of position model and use the X model function that you defined above. Uh, ideally, you would use the same values of V initial and A here, right, in order to keep things consistent. Uh, and then down here, we're asking you to add some graphing commands, first of all, to dress this up a little bit, but then to also create a graph of the uh, position data and the position model as well.